to be here with you um, with other practitioners. Um, I would love to say that um, the uh, execution and management of farmers markets is really easy business. Um, I know it is uh, extremely difficult and challenging and frustrating and often um, often the, the, the last thing you encounter is uh, people who point out how helpful it is. Um, more than anything, you're reminded of just how difficult it is to survive. Um, and I think that is in part because we weren't supposed to be here. The um, political and economic system, especially in the post-World War II era, really made the case that um, we um, shouldn't really know where our food comes from. We shouldn't necessarily have a relationship to our food. And the, the social contract that established our food um, and our, our, our social stability and, and the ability of lounging around in cities and working uh, and, and not understanding the true costs of food. Um, that system is beginning to feel very creaky and vulnerable and the, uh, the social context and um, uh, orientation of, of how we make sense, how we put our, our lives together is very much in, um, in an extraordinary moment of, of crisis. And I think we feel this, this, um, this moment of crisis right now, certainly in the United States, but I think you look throughout Europe, the question of how we maintain social cohesion is something that I think we have maybe not all of the answers, but a piece of those answers. And, and I, I think that the, uh, the spiritual and um, social relevance of food is something that we make um, part of the, the revolution of everyday life. And I think we are part of that, that revolution. And, um, and I'd love to share with you some of the, the thoughts that I've, I've had working in farmers markets for really the last 20 years. Um, I calculated a few, a few months ago that I think it was 3,244 days that I spent underneath uh, tents and umbrellas. Um, and this was largely uh, in New Orleans, where um, you all, of course, enjoy your August harvest days. Meanwhile, we are just suffering with only okra, hot peppers, and extraordinary heat and humidity and, and hurricanes approaching. Um, uh, it was marvelous spending time on these particular temporary town squares. Um, now I get to travel markets and um, no one knows who I am. So no one is asking me why is this umbrella like this? Why are the wrong customers showing up today? So I now am uh, executive director of Slow Food USA and, uh, and work very closely with Slow Food Canada and, uh, and are, are very much um, driven by the idea that um, food is more than just fuel. Food is place, it is people, uh, it is, it is a, a currency for culture, uh, for resistance, uh, and for social cohesion. Um, we were uh, founded, our, our origin myth is slow food. Uh, it was in Italy when fast food, American fast food, landed on the shores at the foot of the Spanish steppes, and Italian uh, food ad advocates and journalists and farmers and chefs said, basta, enough of this fast food. Now, had we been um, founded in France, of course, we would have very clearly burned down the McDonald's. Um, <laughs> but um, I think one of the great gifts is that we were founded in Italy. And the Italians said, we don't have the power to stop this, this, this sort of torrent and wheel of homogenization or progress. Um, but what we can do is to begin to rally around the slow foods. The slow food that this industrial food grid does not value. The people that it does not value. The, um, the sacred connection between supply and demand. Um, and what we can do is to begin to rally around the slow food. The indigenous foods that, of course, are being not only trampled but forgotten. But we do so in a way that if we want to change the world, 
We don't do it through sadness, we do it through joy. So ours is a joyful movement. And I stumbled upon it as a farmer's market organizer and I realized, oh my goodness, coming from New Orleans, where we were always told we were slow, irrelevant, not part of the sort of future forward moving idea of progress. And we thought finally an organization, a community of civil society that um, recognizes that we matter and that our holding on to tradition is itself a barricade against this influx of, um, of fast food and the fast food values that are quite honestly destroying communities, robbing rural communities of wealth. So that is who I, I work with, the global slow food movement operating in 160 countries, um, of which Canada is, is in many ways, uh, like the US, among its most important places because we are the origins of this, this fast life. We are also part of civil society as farmers markets. We are agents of change because of the direct human connectedness that occurs between supply and demand. Um, we were not invented, in fact, this is the most ancient mechanism, the origin of cities is itself public markets. And the unique assembly of independent vendors competing in public spaces is itself this extraordinary, very simple, um, logical, difficult to manage mechanism that exerts social change. The social change between supply and demand, uh, between urban and rural, uh, between clever public policy initiatives and practical DIY activity on the ground. Um, we were not supposed to be here. Uh, and I think that the 20th century and, and in North America, I think we've done a better job of destroying some of these traditional elements in the United States than you have. I want to take great pride in that. Um, uh, but we have, we've let elements of civil society erode places where we can build social trust, social cohesion. And, and, I, and I think it's important for us to think of us as a creation of civil society, because it certainly was not uh, the wisdom of central government or philanthropy. It was the wisdom of communities coming together. And this extraordinary explosive growth, a 400% increase in farmers markets in North America in the last um, 15, 20 years, is, um, is staggering. And I think if we think of markets as safe havens for learning, we can begin to, to recognize the link between things that we do versus things that we do well. Now, if you were to think about where we succeed, mobilizing and, and um, mobilizing great volumes of food produce for sale and moving it efficiently through our, through our mechanism. We are not that. We cannot compete with the highly efficient mechanisms of supermarkets, for instance, that can move great volumes of, of, of produce, of foodstuffs um, to the people. There's no question, the single checkout line of the supermarket, the rational global infrastructure that moves food, we cannot compete necessarily with that. Um, when you think of the traditional um, food bank, the idea of, of emergency food assistance, where you stand in a sort of Soviet bread line, um, delivering food to uh, the food insecure, certainly a much more efficient system. However, where we are extremely efficient is in learning. We are an incredible platform for learning. Learning about um, uh, enterprise development, innovation around business, learning about other cultures and places. And it is because if you were to look at where we are an appropriate mechanism for learning, it is because we are incredibly inefficient. So I think we need to embrace our inefficiency. And the inefficiency is that we do not move people through our checkout, checkout lines 
we move people through dozens of checkout lines. And those dozens of checkout lines, you know, if I want to buy pies, I go to the pie lady. If I want to buy mushrooms, I go to the mushroom man. Um, and when I want to choose which strawberries to buy in season, I have a choice. I can buy strawberries from this person because, you know, they were very nice to me last week and they let my, my daughter have a sample. And, and therefore, it signaled to me that I think I want to spend my money here versus there. Well, that kind of inefficiency means that what we create is a stickiness of people sticking around and learning from one another. Now, if we begin to, to, to embrace that inefficiency, we can begin to find out why does that add value. And this raises questions you know, for, for this meeting this weekend. You know, are we an industry or are we a nexus between different industries and different communities? And I, I think we are both. It's obviously the easier answer. Which one are we? We are both. We need to figure out how to improve best practices and, and make our, our, our market organizations work as well, effectively as they can. Um, but also recognize that we are a tool for agriculture. We're a tool for social cohesion. Uh, we're a tool for making city centers safer, more, more appealing. Uh, we're, we're an incredibly effective tool. Um, but in order for us to, to begin to make that case, we need to also measure how effective are we. So how are we doing? Um, so uh, we are now seeing in this age of, uh, you know, you think of the farmer's market revolution of the last quarter century. Uh, we now see new institutions beginning to, to, to bubble up around our farmer's markets. Food hubs, for instance, which uh, this is an image of. Um, CSAs, which are... I have to admit, sort of amazed me how they continue to proliferate. Um, you know, again, very complicated, um, time-consuming mechanism. Uh, boxes, we love to buy food in boxes now. It's a funny 20th century thing, these box schemes. It just, it's, it's, it comes in a box. It, it's gotta taste better. It's a little bit like, you know, food trucks. Food trucks, it's, it's, you know, who would have suspected the food trucks? Because if it's cooked, in a vehicle on wheels, <laughs> it tastes so much better. <laughs> it's astounding. Um, and then we've also seen, you know, this extraordinary um, farm to school phenomena. Really re rethinking our cafeteria as a role of, of school gardens, uh, followed also by um, uh, farm to hospitals. Uh, beginning to think about what on earth are we serving our our, our sick and infirmed in hospitals um, and all. They end up staying there because of the food we're serving. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the importance of agritourism uh, and, and pick your own. Um, the field has become very crowded um, with extraordinary choices. When you think back 20 years, there were not these sorts of choices for local foods, let alone the supermarkets. And it figured out that if I present the produce in the produce department in a manner where it reminds people of a farmer's market, they will feel better about their purchase because they'll forget that it actually is blueberries coming from Chile. Um, they will feel welcome here. So they are learning, they're paying attention to what we're doing, which I think is also an indicator of our success. Um, but this, this ecosystem around this is changing. And I think we need to be very uh, cognizant of this change. Um, and, and I think this may help us to uh, to begin to understand maybe at this juncture, what should we be doing next? And if I can share with you maybe a, a metaphor that, that makes sense, has made sense to us as we've begun to, to think about all of this food movement work, is when the, the food movement emerged, it, um, it was almost like a brush fire. No one saw it coming. You know, the, the sort of um, high-end, high marketing firms, branding firms did not see it coming. They did not suspect that we as humans crave authenticity. Um, so it, it happened very quickly. No one was prepared for it. Certainly government policies were not prepared for it, did not anticipate that there would be this demand, but it happened very quickly. And what happens after a brush fire is that, you know, 
the first things to emerge are the prairie grasses. Very simple um, uh, uh, organisms. Uh, I think farmers markets, CSAs, community gardens, very simple. You can, you can, um, you can erect them rather quickly. I mean, I think back to when I fell into food, uh, coming out of a, a work in social justice, and uh, we thought when we, we sat down with our, um, the mayor and, and city council in New Orleans, well, how complicated can this be? It's farmers and a car park and tents and umbrellas and consumers. And then, of course, once we establish it, it runs itself. Um, <laughs> and we discover that, yes, it runs us. Um, <laughs> uh, but it is a relatively replicable, simple mechanism much like community gardens. Again, easy to establish if you can get access to, uh, to land. Yeah. <laughs> Sustaining them is another story. Um, of course, there are no personalities involved in, uh, in managing these things. But they are fairly low. Um, they don't require the kind of capital investment that other institutions do. Um, so they spread, and I think this is this four to 500% increase, is this spreading of, of prairie grass. But then what we end up doing is creating um, not only growing uh, more and more consumer demand, but we begin to create a narrative that there is this growing market, there's this growing opportunity. We demonstrate by erecting these temporary town squares in places where no one would have imagined this to take place, that there is something happening here, there is opportunity. And because it's a public, and again, the sort of independent vendors competing and in a public setting, that activity inspires other, other people and other organizations. So you begin to see, a little bit like after a brush fire, after the prairie grass, as the ecosystem becomes more hospitable to plants that are more complex, more specialized, you begin to find others who operate in the local food economy figuring out some innovations that uh, begin to compete with our attention. Um, they recognize, for instance, that, well, Saturday morning from 8 to 12 isn't convenient for everyone. So we've developed a mechanism to go <coughs> indoors when it rains or provide you know, boxes and you can order them online. I mean, all of a sudden, others are beginning to figure out ah, there's opportunity here. And, and they may be better placed to do some of the things that we, we, we have to or we, we attempt to do. And therefore, that ecosystem is beginning to change around us. And it does become a question of, does that ecosystem grow so complex where those specialist organizations, for-profit and non-profit, begin to, to um, uh, crowd out the sunlight that we harvest? And, and does that make it difficult for us to, um, to function, to survive, to thrive? Uh, I mean, I remember one of my early conversations with um, uh, well, a consultant that we were working with who, who'd worked with the Aspen Institute and said, well, um, you see the market as a mechanism if it no longer added value, would you close it? You know, and I thought what he was saying was the most horrible thing. Um, uh, in our beloved market, we could never let it close. But when I thought about it, it's, well, no, I guess that's probably true. I mean, maybe we are that prairie grass that, that, that springs up. And they'll, we'll read about it years later that, you know, the only reason why food survived was because of this emergence of farmers markets. Or... Maybe there's something in that what we do that is unique and that we should really look at that so that we don't wind up um, like the dinosaurs <laughs> and, um, and, and no longer um, have a place in, in our ecosystem. But I do think it is a question that, that for all of our markets, we should consider, um, you know, should we continue to exist? Um, have we created so much competition as these growth of markets begin to crowd out each other? Do we end up cannibalizing off of one another? And I think of the, the sort of medieval um, uh, market town system in Europe, 
where the market moves around from town to town and there's cooperation. Um, I mean, there are, there's so many different directions we can move with this. Is that we do these three things. We double down in that which we do. Um, we offload those things that um, we do, but we struggle to do them. And that maybe others now exist and can actually take on some of that work. So we could sunset some of those things. Um, and then I think most importantly, we measure. And, and measurement is intimidating. And I know that in BC, you've done some extraordinary measurement of your markets. Um, and tomorrow, I, I, I'm going to be um, running a, a workshop on, on measurement. Um, measurement need not be so intimidating that you end up putting it off to next season because uh, we're just not really equipped to do it, is figure out things that, that you can measure. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it, it has, it's useful to have those, those indicators. So in terms of the doubling down, um, and, and, and I briefly described uh, the organization that I founded in New Orleans, Market Umbrella. Um, we, were, we are both a think tank for markets, and, and recognizing the importance of public markets that serve public good, farmers markets being the simplest and ultimately the longest serving, most effective kind of farmers market because of the uh, public market, because of the low overhead, but that is serving public good. And this is the role that they play. And that in markets, and one of the tools that we developed is called the market portrait, one of the easier kind of exercises, online exercises that you do to think about your market and to think about how do four things align. Um, your, your mission, uh, your management, your marketing, and then your measurement. Is do these four things align? Um, and if not, well then what's wrong here? What do we need to alter? And, and of course we should be living organizations. So we may serve a role, you know, two years into the market, but in 10 years, it may solve, you know, serve an evolving role. So I think we, we, we double down. We offload programs. And I think of the number of programs we developed out of the market. And I think because the market is a public experience. You don't have to join the market as a consumer. You walk onto the campus and you're there. And once you're on the campus of the market, it is very clear, formal or informal, that there are rules associated with functioning here. Uh, decency, food handling guidelines, um, mutual aid. Um, you, you, you sometimes can't put your finger on it, but that because you're here, you feel lighter. You feel, um, you feel somewhat liberated because there is a sense of pause and, and, and calm amongst the, you know, the mad dash for produce. Um, now, we know behind the scenes <laughs> there's also so much competition and personalities and you know you try not to I remember my first you know few months learning about markets and a market manager in uh, North Carolina said well, you just want to make sure there are no fist fights <laughs> and, and I thought this is not my experience. Um, this is what I'm getting into. Um, but I think this speaks to the management job of how do we um, create a space that makes people feel welcome, especially in a community where social cohesion is, has become difficult or has always become difficult. Um, race and class, um, uh, certainly in this age of, of refugees, how do we make people feel, feel welcome? And, and because we create spaces where um, there's a recognition that the rules here are something that just makes me feel like I belong here, that I want to spend time here, the space of the market is one that incubates a lot of creative ideas. Whether I think it's the Edible Schoolyard program in New Orleans got, got um, uh, established over standing in front of the strawberry booth over a cup of coffee in the farmer's market. Um, that incubator of ideas is something that we do that we may not even recognize that this is what we do. And some of those ideas, people run with them because they're inspired by the market. Some of those, some of those ideas you may actually incubate in your market. 
Well, some of them may grow so big that they become a distraction. So it may be appropriate to let programs, you incubate them and they, and they, they go elsewhere. Or they're not functioning and shut them down. You know, do it in an orderly fashion, but it's okay for some things not to work. And then lastly, I'll just quickly sort of spend some time on the question of measurement, because it is daunting. Um, I do think we need to measure our success. Now, of course, we should all be using the same metrics, but it's not one size fits all, the capacity of the market, um, the general anarchy of our, our movement. It means that we may not actually yield the same kind of metrics. Um, we tried to develop some very standard measurement tools that we developed in, in, in the US. And of course, every market has their own idea of it. And, but in any case, measurement. Do not be scared of measurement. And I think I've got a couple of, these are some of the economic measurement tools. I mean, if you think about, uh, and it's funny, I never thought I was a capitalist. Um, but I am when I'm a social capitalist, um, or a natural capitalist, or, uh, you know, there's so many different forms of capital that we are accruing. The forecast tool is one that is actually, and these are all free tools on the, the, the Market Umbrella site, uh, to just begin to forecast what is the business model of, of uh, managing you know, your budget. Seed is the sticky economy evaluation device that we developed to measure the informal economic activity inside the farmer's market. And I think we should embrace the fact that informal doesn't mean unprofessional. It means direct human contact, the direct marketing, the informal activity is, in many ways, I think, the future. I mean, when you think of this day and age of pop-up possibilities, the food truck, the pop-up restaurant, um, the pop-up tents, um, this is becoming emblematic of this kind of pirate-driven economy of people who are with few resources but incredible creativity are growing alternatives with what resources we have within our, our, our reach. Um, this informal activity is based on direct human contact, the trust that is built between supply and demand, between restaurant chefs and farmers, between in conversations. How do we measure this informal activity? Well, we do it through customer intercept surveys. I mean, just very standard mechanism. But then how do we link it with the formal economic activity that our farmers markets instill wherever we land. There is no question that when shoppers come to the farmers market and spend their money and have their session of gossiping and then go to the nearby hardware store or supermarket to spend money, that we, are, <coughs> we must leverage and utilize how we leverage that economic activity because we are helping to create it by being there. So tools like, like Seed do that. Rapid market assessment was developed by some cooperative extension agents in Oregon. Um, and a marvelous creative tool where you put little stickers um, in the market and you voice sort of the temperature of where you are, who you are. I think it's very important to figure out who are your customer base so that you can keep them. Um, that's a marvelous set of tools and a great exercise. And the Farmers Market Coalition, uh, the, the national organization in the US, is also building a, you know, tools as well that are also meant to be easy, easy to use. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, and especially at the end of the frigid, raining, horrible, when is this weather going to end kind of day, it is the social capital that we build that I think is what keeps us under the umbrella. Um, and I, I think of, uh, in particular, uh, conversations that I'd, I'd have with shoppers in um, January, uh, when oddly enough we can grow strawberries in in, um, in Louisiana in January, and uh, uh, Isabella, who's a immigrant fam farming family that um, has made a great success of things in, in Louisiana, grows strawberries, uh, and some of the old strawberries that we had otherwise abandoned, and uh, I remember on one of the January days when. Uh, it was horrible, horrible weather, and a shopper came out and she, and she said, you know, I just couldn't imagine you being here 
Isabel, the strawberry farmer, and me being warm in bed listening to the radio, having a cup of coffee, um, because I know that I am part of your community. And that kind of strong um, commitment to one another, and these are not strong social ties. We're not necessarily going to go on holiday with our shoppers. <laughs> Um, these are the weak social ties. The weak social ties are the very ones that hold a community together, that make people feel welcome, building social trust. And we began to find with the study that we did, uh, studies we did in, in, in LA, in Brazil, and in, in New Orleans in the post-Katrina zone, was that especially in times of stress, especially in times of stress, um, it is so important to find those mechanisms that build social social trust. And farmers markets are one of those mechanisms. And we looked for what are the indicators that do this. And the one that really surprised us, and, and this is the trust between different communities, the, the bridging social capital between producer and consumer, between host community and market organization. Like, do we have social trust? Was we asked whether um, in Brazil, in, in, in up in the Amazon, uh, whether vendors would allow for shoppers to buy food on um, uh, uh, on credit, you know, I didn't come up, I didn't bring enough money today. Can I pay next week? And um, we were rather alarmed and, and, and intrigued by this, and we thought, well, no, we don't do that in the U.S. Um, and then discovered that so many of our our vendors actually would allow people to get their product without paying for it. And they said, I know you'll be back next week, you can pay then. And it may not be for all of your groceries, but I really need a, you know, beets or broccoli, can I? And they're like, of course, you can pay next week. Well, you, you can't do that at Walmart. Um, I mean, you can use your credit card, and that's between you and your credit card company, but you cannot actually enjoy that level of trust and intimacy with people you otherwise may not even know their name. You may just know them as Mr. Broccoli. Um, and I think that the fact that we provide the conditions for social trust is something that we can trade on. And, and I think in particular when you get to um, developing social programs, especially for those that address food security, um, we we create healthy communities if there are elements of trust in place. This is something that we do well. We should really trade on this because if we're able to make people feel welcome and comfortable and happy in a space that is informal, what kind of programming can we do? And I think this speaks to the extraordinary leadership that you have done, and Peter in particular, I mean, I've been following what you have done here in British Columbia. And again, working with the um, uh, Ministry of Agriculture um, is developing vouchers, coupons, that reward people for the risk it takes to venture into the unknown um, to purchase more fruits and vegetables. And heaven knows we need to be eating more fruits and vegetables. Um, it is based on the fact that we create an environment that is welcoming. Now, we don't all do it magnificently well, and I think that's why meeting at a weekend like this, we can begin to think about how can we improve? How do we make this a more welcoming place? Is, are, are, um, is signage you know, in multiple languages? Um, are there, there are many tools that can be developed to, to lure people to the market so that they feel welcome. To begin to develop programs like the vouchers, or in the US, we have food stamps. I don't know if I brought it, I always travel with um, a wooden token. Um, this is how, like alchemists, we would turn plastic into wood um, for not only credit and debit cards um, using these wireless devices that are now uh, available, um, but also for um, food stamps, for food security programs. Um, rather than every farmer having their wireless device, the market organization would have one which means we then run these banks or casinos with uh, tokens, um, but able to make it accessible. And so I think measuring that, that element of social trust becomes a springboard for working collaborative, co collaboratively with government to develop innovative programs that are beginning 
to populate the world as we begin to look at the level of risk and recognize the risk, not only for the farmer to come to market, but for the consumer to come to market. Um, and then, of course, the other area where we succeed um, remarkably is in building human capital. And, and this is where we learn about new flavors. Um, for generations who've not grown up eating fruits and vegetables, or if they did, they're in bags, or they're frozen, or they're, they're not fresh, is it takes a good, uh, research has found it takes a good eight times for a kid to eat something before they begin to recognize that it's not gonna go away, and that they're gonna have to learn how to love it. Um, but that they do learn to love it. They begin to develop the palate for it. And this is, from a slow food standpoint, very much what we care about, because we believe in the profound sense of joy that food brings. And that the markets are joyful places where um, you begin to become more risky and dangerous and you try a kohlrabi or, or something that you didn't know how to pronounce you know, before um, because of the, the, the setting. This is something that we do well in our measurement tools to begin to figure out by, how, by what percentage are you introducing consumers to new foods and what role that plays in public health. Um, and then natural capital. And I, I think here is, we've yet to even begun this in any great, um, I think serious manner, is what are the, the mechanisms, what are the indicators, the proxies of how we are improving the ecological sustainability of our regions. I mean, we are interested in the ecology of local economies but we're also interested in the economy of local ecologies. And I think there are so many different methods to, to measure this. And it may just be choosing one, one that you know that you're good at. And I think it's the importance of measuring things that we are good at. Now at Slow Food, we have a uh, global program um, that really gets to the core of, of what we are as an organization. We are a food security organization, but at an even deeper level, we are a food sovereignty organization. We believe in the sovereignty of communities to grow the food that means something to us, that is part of our history and our place, and that tells the story of who we are. Even if who we are is that we're a mishmash of lots of different people who come together, food tells that story. And so we have this, this, this Noah's Ark of endangered foods called the Ark of Taste. And the Ark of Taste is this global living catalog of foods that we feel are valuable, um, even if the industrial food system says this breed or this variety of, of tomato um, doesn't ship well um, or uh, doesn't serve our industrial needs. We as communities, families, individuals, believe that these foods need preserving. And the best way to preserve them, you know, to save them, is to eat them. Uh, we've seen in North America in the last 100 years, 95% of our biodiversity disappear. Okay. Farmers markets are extraordinary mechanisms to, uh, and these, these are just a, there, there are 300 um, Arc of Taste products in the US. I don't know the number in Canada, I should have done my research on that beforehand. Um, but I think it's 145 um, products. But of course, the products move across boundaries. These are ones from the Pacific Northwest. So I thought some of these, probably ones you recognize, like the macaws at potato or, um, or some of the other ones here. Um, by, by placing products on the arc of taste, what it says to the, to, to the heroes who are preserving these products is that there is a global community that values what you do and that by growing this product, you are adding value to your array of products on sale at the market, especially if linking with chefs who can add value to their menu by acknowledging that we have, we're growing a product that's from the Arc of Taste on, on our restaurant menu. So this is one of the tools that gets to the core of our commitment to biodiversity and food sovereignty. Um, and I think it's a matter of mapping, not just the the biodiverse products of particular seed stock or animal breeds, but also actual food preparation, particular baked dishes that maybe are, are disappearing, is that we need to rally around them. 
Um, for, coming from New Orleans, a culturally Catholic place, Lent is this extraordinary time on the calendar where we begin to identify and discover um, this, this sort of culinary adventure of St. Joseph's Day and what Sicilian immigrants brought to our, our, our food culture um, and certain dishes. St. Patrick's Day or gumbo des herbes because of the blending of, of uh, African and, um, and Caribbean cuisine um, with a green gumbo. Every calendar item you know, provides an opportunity to reconnect to traditional foods that matter and are valued by, an, by a growing number of consumers. And, and it is, is for that reason that I think we must acknowledge that we are defending an ancient mechanism that is at the core of civilization. The dignity of labor, the dignity of commerce, the dignity of the consumer who, um, for whom we are all at the end of the day eaters and making all of our decisions as if we are the eater themselves. And this ancient mechanism does not appear to be going anywhere, despite our efforts in the 20th century to push it out of existence. It um, is capturing people's imagination, policymakers' imagination, and um, and I hope, I hope, hopefully, as you go into your next market season, your imagination to defend the future. And and I hope that you would reach out to Slow Food as an ally who cares about and believes in the difficult, often rainy, um, long hours of working in the field and in the markets uh, to bring the, um, the joy and, and dignity back to food in our communities um, so that through that we can build community. And with that, thank you very much for inviting me here.